I'm Sister Catherine Ryan from Maryville Academy. Our guest this evening is Dr. Edgar Ramos, who is here from Concordia University and also from the Maryville Behavioral Health Clinic. I uh, uh, want you to know that you are watching Maryville Cares. This is a live interactive show on CAN TV 21. We are also streaming online at cantv.org backslash hotline. This next 25 minutes is your opportunity to listen to and to discuss with Dr. Ramos about mental illness in the family. This is a part of our series of Maryville Cares. Maryville has been caring for children since 1883. The call-in number is at the bottom of the screen, 312-738-1060. Now let us begin with Dr. Ramos. Dr. Ramos, I'm delighted that you're here. Can you help us first understand what is mental illness? Well, thank you for having me, Sister Kathy. Well, mental illness actually is a wide array of mental health disorders. And the easiest way to think about mental health disorders is by probably our most common examples of depression, anxiety, eating disorders, substance abuse, schizophrenia. That's the easiest way to think of and, and conceptualize mental illness. And Dr. Ramos, how does one know that a family member may be suffering from uh, one of these mental illnesses? You're a parent, you see your child, what would the, would the parent see? Well, there's a long list of symptoms that one can become aware of depending on what the particular disorder is. So obviously, uh, depression is not necessarily going to look like schizophrenia, substance abuse, ADHD. So it would really depend. So th the first thing I would do is give a cautionary that whenever a family is uh, worried or concerned about their child, the first thing that they should always do is look at talking to their family physician uh, and receiving those types of advices from them first and foremost. Uh, once they get the clear that there's nothing eminent and no immediate hospitalization is required, the next thing would be is to look at um, how are socialization skills happening? How are friends in the neighborhood, friends at school? Looking at that, how are things changed within the home? Is looking at your most obvious kind of symptoms that you would suspect should be pretty much normal, uh, such as the child is isolating, withdrawn, not eating anymore, overeating, oversleeping, undersleeping, any kind of things that uh, are off the norm, that aren't typical for this child, are, are, are always a red flag, is always something to be concerned about. That would be the first step, is really looking at what's just off-putting, just isn't right. Um, the next step would be looking at a lot of resources, calling uh, your local clinicians in, in, in the neighborhood that can provide you with at least a good, clear initial intake or clear initial um, clear to say, you know, why don't you bring your child in, let's talk, let's just look over this thing uh, and make sure that everything is okay. So the first thing is just really just looking and observing. So Dr. Ramos, so our listeners know, uh, when, I, when I'm telling them that you're Dr. Edgar Ramos, please tell us some of your experience in this area so they know why you know what you're talking about here. Well, uh, I've been in the field uh, to some capacity for 20 years. Um, at many different levels from doing therapy to providing direct care to working as a licensed clinical psychologist. Uh, I have been a graduate since 2006, so I have been a psychologist for quite a number of years. I have experience working at hospital systems, residential facilities, outpatient clinics. Uh, I own and operate my own clinic as well, uh, as well as an assistant professor at Concordia University. So I have a very multitude of experience working with youth and families. And when a parent comes to you, Dr. Ramos, and says, I don't know what to do for my child, what will that conversation be that you have with the parent? It's a great question. Uh, the first thing is, and sometimes one of the most obvious things that's avoided, is actually soothing the anxiety or the stress that the parent is feeling. I know, obviously, every parent is first and foremost concerned is to worry about their child, um, but it's also easing the parent and letting the parent know that things are going to be okay, that there's always some kind of resource, that there's always something that we can do uh, to help facilitate the care of that uh, young person. Uh, again, the family is going to need resources and support as well. Uh, going through a struggle or a child having um, a bona fide mental health disorder is not just the child's problem, it's the family's problem. And that's one of the angles that we at the Maryville Family Behavioral Health Clinic work from. It's working with the family because when one child suffers in a home, the whole family is suffering with the same pain. So we really work at 
at trying to gather where are the parents at with this particular issue, how do the parents feel, what are the things that they'd like to see done, what are the things that they feel could happen, what are the things that uh, they feel went wrong or whatever the family is experiencing. We really look at gathering information from the whole family and dealing with it in a holistic approach. Some families have special needs and special requests that they uh, may not find uh, okay to ask sometimes. So we assure them that however they see fit in terms of what they feel is best for the child, we try to incorporate that, be it spirituality. Anything that, that's, that's needed, we try to, to focus on what's in the best interest for this child and for this family. So, Dr. Ramos, uh, we at Maryville care for children of different ages, and sometimes the children do need some help with uh, counseling uh, and therapy, as you're describing. But a common answer we might get from one of our children when we first refer the child is, I'm not going, I'm not crazy. What do you say to that child? Another great question. Well, uh, dealing with the resistant child is, is always something that's going to be difficult. Uh, depending on the age level, the resistance can be anywhere from just, well, I don't really want to be here to a defined, I'm not getting out of the car, you can't make me come in. One of the things that I pride myself on at, at the clinic is that we have a very good, diverse bunch of staff. And what I mean by that is that some have very specialized uh, training working with very young children as young as three years old, some specialize in working with adolescent teenagers. So one is the training and skills behind it, being able to how to manage that. The other thing is, is that, as you can see, we don't all wear ties and scare children to think that we're working from some kind of, you know, uh, executive branch, that we're really trying to communicate. Even I them. dressed for that approach yes, for today. Yes, absolutely. So we try to make sure that the child feels comfortable. One of the biggest things and, and most concerning things is assuring that the child is comfortable. Uh, and how do you make someone comfortable is being real to a degree with the child, not talking above their head, not talking and using clinical words that the child nor the family understands. So it's really about that relationship you build with the child as well as the family. So the relationship is extremely pivotal in assuring that the child feels comfortable in talking. Obviously, maybe the first session or the second may be difficult if the child is resistant and doesn't want to go in. But we don't uh, recommend a child come in and stand the whole hour. If they can sustain at least 10, 15 minutes, we do 10, 15 minutes. And then we come back and try to lengthen a little bit more. As the child becomes more comfortable, the relationship starts to get established. The child will slowly want to come in on his own. Now, many times we hear talk of trauma-informed therapy. Can you tell our parents and family members what does that mean for them and for the children? Well, trauma-informed care is really looking at the child from a holistic angle that things in their past, things in their history can or may have been traumatizing in that um, such things, scary events, fear of, uh, of death or some death-defying issue occurring in their life can have significant and long-standing issues in the child. Being bullied as a young man, being bullied as a young lady, uh, and then going surpassing that at an older age can still reflect at an older age in which children can develop eating disorders, late depression, anxiety because of things from their past such as bullying. Those are traumatizing events. So we tend to work from an angle that we really look and explore at the whole of the child from past issues to present issues to current. Just because a child is expressing concern now or no minimal concern now doesn't mean that there may have been things in the past that really have affected where they're at now. Well, it, it seems, Dr. Ramos, that we have a caller. Could you put the caller through, please? Hi there. Um, and I apologize if this question has already been answered or asked, um, but I just tuned in a little bit ago. Um, I wanted to ask, at what point with uh, your child or with a family member do you um, seek professional help at, and not, like, pass it off as just, you know, maybe a terrible twos or a spoiled child or acting out or something like that? Thank you for that question, Dr. Ramos. It's a great question. Well, uh, a parent's concern for the child is never something minimal. It's always something that we want to assure that I want to make sure my child is okay. So I would never say uh, be too safe or overly cautious. What I would recommend is that if you see something or feel something that's out of the norm, that's concerning to you, uh, just like with any illness, we would always go to the doctor or go to the clinic just to do a checkup. The same thing happens in mental health is that we can always go in and just have someone disengage and talk and develop uh, what we would call an initial assessment. And that initial assessment would just say, you know, your, your child may be dealing with this or may be looking at this uh, or that. And we just do an initial question just to see how things are going. We may find that there's absolutely nothing 
eminent at the moment, we may find that something may be there that may, we may want to explore a little further. But it's the same process that you would do anything. A little cut can turn into a bacterial infection. A little sadness can turn into a severe depression. So what I would say, it's always in the best interest if you have a fear, if you have a concern, it doesn't hurt to do an initial appointment and just get some consultative services to, to reassure, one, your own stress as well as the safety of your child. Can I just pick up then on uh, some of what you were talking about with the depression, Dr. Ramos? We see the tragedy of some of our beautiful young people uh, taking their own lives because they somehow felt so overwhelmed they didn't think there was any future or hope for them. Can you speak to that? What, do, what kinds of signs can parents look for? And they aren't parents. You're not always going to see those signs. But what signs might parents see? And what's, as if they see a problem, what steps can they take? Well, again, I, I want to reiterate, uh, Sister Kathy, what you said is that sometimes we may not see um, the signs and symptoms that a child is suffering. Uh, sometimes they're so well hidden or so well put inside that we can't really just see the difference in our child. Uh, so I would never want to put the burden on a parent or family that they miss something. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes kids just don't express themselves in a the manner that we can see it. It's not that obvious. Um, some of the obvious things that we could see is, uh, again, one of the quickest is to look at if a child is withdrawn or isolated. And, and what I mean by that is if a child is not coming out of the room, they're not communicating, they're not um, hanging out with friends, they, they have no interest in socializing outside of uh, home, those are some of your initial red flags to kind of look at. If your child has differences in eating patterns, if you start noticing uh, cuts on their arms, cuts on their legs, or, or anything of that, those are things that you're, are a you're little bit more obvious apparent, uh, signs that you want to be cautious for and, and look towards. Again, there's no specific set of, of, of concerns because it, it all is contingent on what the issue is at hand. Uh, if a child can be bullied that day and, and, and find himself at his wit end, that, that can spark and trigger a, a a suicidal ideation or idea to, to want to harm himself. So we always just want to be cognizant of what's going on and watch and observant. Uh, one of the things is always being observant of our, chil of our, of our children. Um, but again, some signs just are not so obvious. I want to give a number in case any of our viewers have a, a need for help in the future. And so I'm going to give you this uh, website from Maryville Academy along with our phone number there so that you can use that. I want to remind you that you're watching Maryville Cares live on CanTV21 and on CanTV.org backslash hotline. Maryville Cares, we've been caring for children since 1883. And this evening's discussion is mental illness. Our guest is Dr. Edgar Ramos from Concordia University and also from the Maryville Family Behavioral Health Clinic. Now, Dr. Ramos, let's go back to some of what you were discussing about reaching out to them. When a family comes to you with their child um, and they are willing to engage in treatment, you've, you've uh, been able to talk with the young person and the family, and you're, what does that treatment look like? Well, again, it's contingent on what the particular issue is at, at hand. So treatment can look uh, very different for very different mental health disorders. Uh, one, two, is treatment looks very different depending on the individual at hand. Um, Everybody practices from their own modality or model of care, uh, and some clients prefer specific models of care. So treatment can look very different. What I can say and what's different about treatment or how we approach it as a whole is that every individual that comes in is provided an individual treatment plan. And what that means is that individual care is provided for this. We don't use a kind of all or nothing approach, a, a, a cookie cutter approach for lack of a better word. We really tailor our approaches to fit the needs and demands of that particular client. Uh, moreover, we tend to involve the family. Whenever we work from a child or with a child, uh, everybody's involved. The family's involved to the extent that it doesn't hinder or approach on the child's uh, safety as well as uh, ability to disclose information that they feel uh, only their clinician should know. So we tend to really work from an individualistic model of care. So now you've brought up the privacy question. I'm the child, I speak with you, <clears throat> so I assume that you will not tell my parents what I tell you? Great question. We get that asked <coughs> every time we have a, a, an adolescent or a child come in. Uh, the rules are, are not specifically explicit within uh, our own ethics guidelines. And what I mean by that is that 
one of the most things, or one of the things that, that is clear is that if a child's danger, uh, safety, is at risk, uh, meaning that if there's a risk of harm to self or others, that will require disclosure, and that is part of our ethical stance, is that we do have to disclose. Um, because the parent is the legal guardian of, uh, of the child, as well as the payee source, the parent is allowed and guaranteed the right to subpoena the file or request for the file, so they can read specific things that are going on. The question really lies in how much information is actually put into uh, the chart or put into the, 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 the request. Uh, how that's typically done is that a conversation is actually held with the family as well as the child in terms of the dangers of saying too much, relaying too much information to the family, and how that may impact the child's ability to disclose information. If the parents know everything, what we've seen is that some kids will not want to talk, won't want to discuss anything. So we tend to be very open with how much each one wants to know, how much is okay and how much is not okay. What we found, or what I found in my experience, is a lot of parents will right from the bat say, you know, I don't really want to know everything. I just want to know they're okay. Just tell me that and give me some brief updates. And what we do with the brief updates is uh, typically near the end of the session, we always invite the parent in. Any questions you have to say, anything you'd like to add, or we give them a monthly report on how everything has been going. Uh, I like to encourage the child himself to say, hey, at the end of every session, why don't you talk to your parents? Tell them what you did. Tell them how it was going. Or at the end of the month, something big had happened. You know, let's work on you figuring out how do you do, have that communication with your with your own parent. I think it's important that the child has us as a resource to disclose information, talk about some of the things they may not feel comfortable with. But the goal is always to gain more comfort talking with other people as well, not just relying solely on a clinician and becoming dependent on one person, but having a network of resources so they can look towards other people within the family. So uh, we've gone into treatment. Uh, we think it's going well. And I'm going to give you this question, this analogy to physical health, if I may. Yes. If I have a cold, I hope I take the appropriate steps if I have to take medicine and I'm cured. On the other hand, if I have something like arthritis, I may learn about it and what to do for it, but it's probably with me for life. What about mental illness? <coughs> Okay, so that's a, a little bit more of a deeper question is, uh, is mental illness for life? Um, I don't think anybody has the most specific answer or the answer to determine whether or not mental illness what li is a long life-term um, issue. What I can say is that uh, I've seen, in my, at least in my experience and what I've learned, is that mental illness can be managed depending on the severity of the particular mental illness. Um, from a, a depression, for example, um, a lot, there's individuals that may function with a long-standing depression uh, and have it managed and, and live normal lives, live lives that are just as, as productive as anybody else. Uh, obviously, some depressive states may require hospitalization, uh, medication, uh, and they may not live a, uh, such a happy, fulfilled life. So I've seen both sides of the spectrum. Uh, I've seen individuals that do eight sessions and their depression is subsided and, and managed to a degree. Uh, I've seen some that I've had to work with for years working with their, with their depression and managing. Uh, it vacillates. It goes up and down. Uh, so the question in terms of is it something that you live with for life? Not necessarily. Can you? Yes. Can it be managed throughout life? Yes. So it really depends on the particular mental health disorder that the individual is dealing with. And do I need to take medications to get well? Uh, well, if we look at the most current research for some particular disorders, again, such as depression, a combination of medication and CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, is the most well-researched, evidence-based practice that you'll see for the treatment of depression. It doesn't mean that you have to take medication. It doesn't mean that medication is not useful. It means that uh, with um, a team effort, working with a psychiatrist and a good team, determining what's the best fit for the individual is always best practice. Seeing if medication is something useful, uh, that's something that the family as well as the child agree to, in conjunction with therapy. One without the other is never recommended. Both in conjunction with one another is always best practice. It's something that we look towards. One of the benefits at the Family Behavioral Health Clinic is that we have an on-site psychiatrist that works directly with our clinicians to determine what's the best fit, what's the best approach to manage these particular issues that the individuals come with at that particular time. And how does the family pay for this? Well, uh, insurance is, is we take all forms of insurance at, at the clinic, uh, <laughs> Medicaid, Medicare, as well as all Blue Cross Blue Shield. So insurance is always uh, the, the first line of, uh, of payment. 
Um, we do have prorated services and we have uh, services in which we lower the rates for families that aren't able to provide. If the rates are still difficult for the family, uh, we do take on a, a minimum number of pro bono cases to help facilitate and provide referrals and resources for the family to continue on in services. We always find a way at Marywood to treat and uh, help the people that come to our door. And uh, just a, a moment on this, a subject of another show, but does uh, do you in the clinic also treat children who are dealing with substance abuse as well as mental illness? Absolutely. Substance abuse is, is, is just another subset of mental illness. Um, what you're going to see is either a dual diagnosis, specific substance abuse, or some mental illness that's caused the substance abuse. So we, we work very hand in hand. We do have a substance abuse counselor um, that works specifically, specifically with substance abuse matters at our clinic. However, all our clinicians, as well as myself, are also trained in working with dual diagnosis of substance abuse, as well as our psychiatrists. So it's safe to say that everyone within our site deals with and works with substance abuse issues. And I should say that our clinic has uh, five different sites. Well, those will be uh, available through our Maryville number. Um, and this will be substance abuse of children by children will be the subject of another Maryville Cares. So thank you uh, for watching tonight and for participating in this show. I am Sister Catherine Ryan from Maryville Academy. I am delighted that our guest tonight has been Dr. Edgar Ramos. I think you've heard now uh, that Dr. Ramos has a great deal of experience. Dr. Ramos is, uh, teaches at Concordia University. He also uh, serves as a clinical director at our Maryville Family Behavioral Health Clinic. And if you need more information about us, I'm going to give you one more time our number so that you can reach us. And uh, if you as a family are facing some of these difficult questions and you want to call, and speak with someone. We don't give medical advice over the phone, but we can give reference information. If you are seeking a clinic in an area near you, whether it's Maryville's clinic or someone else's clinic, we can at least tell you what some of the resources are and certainly uh, offer if you have a desire to come in for an assessment at the clinic, we can make that possible uh, because Maryville cares. We've been caring for children since 1883 and we know that the best outcome for children, where possible, is that they are safely at home with their family and all the family together has the support to deal with these kinds of challenges. Thank you and good evening.